Uh, welcome everybody to the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Today we are pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew Taylor, who will be presenting on When Salafi Muslims Meet Evangelical Christians, a hopeful dispatch from the United States. Please remember to keep your microphones muted for the duration of the presentations. And during the Q&A later, you can ask questions via the chat feature in Zoom or by using the raise hand function and unmuting your microphone to speak when called upon. Our session today will be chaired by Imam Adil Zaib. Adil is a global TEDx speaker, interfaith advocate, and social justice scholar. He served as the first Muslim president of the National Association of College and University Chaplains, and he is currently pursuing doctoral studies in diversity, equity, and inclusion in religious studies from Claremont University. Adil, thank you for chairing this presentation today. I'll go ahead and hand it over to yeah. you. Thank you so much. All right. Um, well, we are very, very excited to be here today. Um, uh, you know, I'm, and this book is amazing for those who have not read it yet. Uh, I really uh, identify with many of the components of the book, both from uh, an Islamic perspective and also from an interfaith perspective um, with the relational components. Um, so I wanted to start off, um, if I can ask Matthew a question, um, what is scripture, uh, what is the book about, right? Um, tell us about the book. What, what, in, in a quick summary, what would you say the main purpose of writing the book was and what's it all about? Right, yeah. Thank you, Adil. Thank you um, to the Oxford Interfaith Forum for having me. Thank you to our participants for joining today, especially those of you who are joining from North America. I, thank you for doing this rather than going outside to stare at the sun that is disappearing. Um, so the, the book um, uh, actually began um, for me when I was a seminarian. Um, I was at Fuller Theological Seminary um, in California, and uh, I, I, um, I realized that I was very interested in Islam, was very interested in, um, in studying Islam and understanding more about Islam. And the more that I studied this group of, of Muslim thinkers and, and leaders called the Salafis, the more I experienced um, what, I, what I describe in the book as, as experiences of deja vu. Uh, things that, that that echoed and resonated in particular ways for me as somebody who was evangelical at the time now as uh, I, I don't I no longer identify as evangelical but had, had, as somebody who was very much shaped in an evangelical context and by an evangelical experience and and I I, I wound up getting a PhD and writing my dissertation the, the book is actually kind of emerged from my dissertation um, really to try to kind of understand that question why was I having these experiences of deja vu um, and uh, Jonathan Z. Smith, who I quote early on in the book, who's one of my one of my favorite scholars of religion, talks about comparative religion um, and comparative religious projects begin in these experiences of deja vu, where we we feel like we're 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 studying another tradition, we're studying something that it should be foreign to us, and yet we we have these experiences, the, these echoes, the, we we hear these resonances, and we're trying and we try to make sense of those resonances. Um, and so I started diving in deep into trying to understand Salafism, especially Salafism in America, um, because I felt like the, the more I, 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 I tried listening to kind of Salafi preachers and read Salafi literature from other cultural contexts, but the more that I looked at the American case, the more I noticed similarities to evangelicalism. Um, and I'm not the first to observe these similarities between um, really between Protestants and Salafis. I mean, sometimes Salafis themselves, when they are speaking in Western contexts, will describe themselves as the Protestant reformers of Islam. And so I really wanted to get underneath that to think about um, what are the similarities, what are the differences, and um, why do we know why why is there this convergence, especially in the American space? Um, and so the book comes out of that that question. Um, and I, I really focused in on, on one major institution of Salafism in the United States, Al-Maghrib Institute. Um, and I, I, as I realized in the course of my studies, um, Salafism in the U.S. Cha has changed a lot in the last 30 years. In, 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 and 9-11 was in many ways a catalyst for that. So for those who might not be familiar with Salafism, um, it's a renewal movement in modern Islam. Um, has its roots in much earlier movements um, in other kind of renewalist currents of Islam, especially within the Sunni tradition, but it really kind of crystallizes in the 20th century. Um, and um, it's it, the, the, the goal of Salafism is to get back to the experience of the Salaf, the, the, the righteous ancestors, the first three generations of Muslims. 
I mean, to, get, to recapture that ethos. And the, the mode of, of trying to access that is through, the, especially the Hadith, the, 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 the sort of, it, you could call it the secondary scripture of Islam or, or the surrounding scripture of Islam. The, the Hadith are the, the sayings and the actions, the recorded sayings of the, and actions of the Prophet Muhammad and his companions that has become a, a sort of interpretive matrix that surrounds the Quran and gives it context. And the Salafis want people to directly encounter the Hadith. They want everyone to study the Hadith. They want everyone to access scripture. And that's that, that's kind of where the title of the book actually comes from, is this idea that even within our religious traditions, right, there's a lot of access points. There's a lot of ways that we tie in to religion, whether it's Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism. But for particular communities, scripture becomes their 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 core point of access and that that direct access to scripture that direct connection to scripture is very crucial to them and um so as i as i as i studied this and as i as i really dug into it and started interviewing some of these salafi leaders i i just started noticing all these points and and um somebody at one point suggested an analogy from um from uh biology um that there's there's this there's this idea of convergent evolution right that that different um uh, uh animals can develop very similar traits but be, evolve they can be completely genetically detached from each other right so birds and bats both fly they both have wings but they they, they are not genetically related right and so it's it's the environment and and the, the the pressures of the environment that really shape that and so the book is trying to kind of think about the this american case study and i'll just just kind of um maybe close my my, my comments with this um what i discovered in looking into American Salafism is something that um, is not reflected in any of the literature on Salafism that I could that I had found. Um, what I, if you go and read a lot of the literature on Salafism, and 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 I'll, I'll just say a lot of that literature, especially the academic literature, has been shaped by counterterrorism studies um, because um, Al, Al Qaeda and ISIS both identified as Salafi. Um, that 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 terrorism lens has really um, 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 molded the, the discourse around Salafism. So this is why people call Salafis radical Islam or radical Muslims. And, and um, but the vast majority of Salafis have, uh, are not um, interested in, in jihad or they're not interested in uh, terrorism. They're, they're, they're interested in scripture study. And so, um, and, and then as I looked at them, there, there, there's also the, this, this lingering legacy of, uh, of the discourse of Islamic fundamentalism. This idea that oh, it, fundamentalism is something attached intrinsically to Islam, even though the term fundamentalism emerges among American Protestants in the 20th century, and that that therefore these folks are rigid, and cannot think differently. And yet the people that I encountered, especially around Al Maghrib, and Al Maghrib has has really reshaped Salafism in the United States as an institution. They, they're very flexible. They're very adaptive. They're very interested in in um, uh, fitting into American culture and living within uh, American society. And um, what I discovered um, in my research was an incredible story of hope of how an environment, in an environment of religious pluralism, even an environment of religious pluralism that is that is, in, that is threatening to to American Muslims and contains all kinds of Islamophobia and prejudice against them. They, they have chosen to, um, uh, to, to to find ways to integrate themselves into the fabric of American pluralism and even develop friendships with evangelicals. Many, many Muslims are, are um, spread through the Bible Belt. And um, right and, and, and what they found is sometimes if, if they want to engage interreligiously, if they want to engage, engage in an interfaith way, some, sometimes the most natural conversation partners are actually the evangelicals, which again, just opens up a whole new possibility when we think about interfaith dialogue, that it might not only be something that, that conventionally happens between liberal Christians and liberal Muslims or liberal Jews and liberal mm -hmm. Muslims, but what, mm -hmm. what, would a, what would a true conservative interreligious dialogue, not premised on agreement, but premised on disagreement, where might that lead us and what, what new possibilities might that open up? So I'll, I'll, yeah. <laughs> that, I'm sure that, that, doesn't, wow. that doesn't go anywhere close to capturing all of it, but that, I'll stop there. Yeah, there's so many follow-up questions, but I, I want I want to stick to the uh, to to the, the book questions that I wanted to yeah. ask you about. So um, I, I think uh, one one element that I wanted to to cover um, is you know the the book title is Scripture People, Salafi Muslims in Evangelical Christians America, right? 
And the, the question that I had was, uh, the same question that I had was, you mentioned, you know, in the pages 223 to 224, that they, that they both move as flocks of birds, uh, moving in, in symphony. And in what ways do you think that's a good thing? And mm. in what ways is it a bad thing? Meaning mm. to have a decentralized flock moving around all the time. Uh, in what ways is that beneficial? And in which ways is that detrimental to spiritual yeah. flocking and, and shepherding of this group? Yeah, that it's it's a great question. Um, I, I, in, in that in that image, I was trying, I was especially grappling with the this terminology of movement. Right, we we use this term yeah. movement so often in reference to religious groups, and yet when we think about a, a movement, I mean, the the the, the joke is a movement's got to move, right? A movement has to um to to, to operate in in um, a cohesive way and and have an agenda and have a purpose. Um, and yet when you observe the thought patterns, the discourse patterns within among evangelicals and among Salafis, um, it does look more like a flock, right? It looks more like a, a they're, 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 because these are decentralized movements with no clear hierarchy, no clear kind of organization. I mean, you, you have, you, sure, there are plenty of people who claim to speak for evangelicalism. There are plenty of people who claim to speak for Salafism, but if you actually compare them and, and put them in conversation with each other, you realize that they're, they're constantly disagreeing and arguing with each other. And I love that the, there's a term that's been coined, um, it, it's specifically in reference to flocks of starlings, these, the, these massive um, uh, flocks of birds that you can sometimes see. And the term, it's, 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 it's an onomatopoeia term. They, they are murmurations. Right, because the the sound of all the wings flapping as as the these kind of flocks of birds kind of mm -hmm. pivot mm -hmm. around all over the sky, and you can see them all moving in coordination. That it, it it sounds like a murmur, and so they call it a murmuration. Um, and and to me that that actually is pretty descriptive of the if 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 you kind of stand back at a distance and observe how evangelicals and Salafis operate, they they do move in a coordinated way. There, there are there are trends there are there's a zeitgeist there, there's something you can track but at the same time it's not very predictable and it's not hierarchical right and I think that 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 really attaches to that 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 close connection to scripture but then everyone's interpreting scripture in different ways right and and uh, it's what Christian Smith uh, the sociologist uh, talks about as the challenge of pervasive interpretive pluralism even among people who claim that they are, are literalists about scripture, right? The literal meaning of scripture is something that is very much up for debate. And so um, I think it, I think where it is a strength to answer your question is in an environment of pluralism, is in an environment of, um, uh, of adaptation, right? Because um, the, 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 the herd sometimes knows the, the, the best route. This sometimes sometimes can move in, 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 in useful directions. But the sacrifice, mm. what is lost in that is coherence. And so to talk today about well, what is the Salafi position in America on X, mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. you can't find it because Salafis themselves yeah. are arguing about it. Obviously, there are things that all Salafis agree on. There are things that all evangelicals agree on. But that is a fairly constricted dimension of things right and the the, the the where really the the amount of disagreement the amount of interpretive pluralism that operates within these communities leads to all this ferment all this all this energy that that is magnetic that draws a lot of people in but then at the same time it's very hard to pin down what what exactly evangelicals or what about exactly salafis have to say about any given yeah. issue and I try to illustrate that in the book, especially around LGBTQ questions and how many different directions that those conversations have, have gone in these communities. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great answer. The flexibility is, is the strength, but also there's a lack of coherence. It is, it is, it is a thing. And I think uh, you mentioned this in your, in the, um, the latter sections of your book and you're mentioning Yakin Institute uh, which was founded, or he's co-founded by uh, Sheikh Dr. Omar Suleiman, and uh, who identifies as humbly himself, you know, republicly, and um, you know, and 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 his popularity is so high now in the states that he posts something on Facebook or Instagram, and then that becomes like the 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 theopraxy of the, ma mm. the Muslim masses in the states. 
they don't know what a Salafi is. They don't know what a, the masses don't know what these things are. Uh, they're just kind of like engineers and, you know, accountants and janitors, whatever. Uh, so they don't understand these things, nuances, but it's just, even though there's no centralized leader, he becomes ipso facto the leader, right? So it's very interesting. It's flexible, but they, they, people always want a leader. So they find a leader, they make a leader out of um, herds. Um, so, you know, there there is a trope that um, we all know that that Muslims uh, want to conquer America and make it uh, United Islam of America, so to speak, right? And um, do you, in your research, think there's any truth to that? Um, and do you think that there is a truth to evangelicals wanting to make it United Christians of America? Hmm. Well, it's, it, it's, it is, it's, it's an important question. Um... I think we have to to think of, especially thinking about. I know because we we have an international audience. Um, thinking about um, the U.S. situation is really important for this, um, right? Um, so there there have been Muslims in the United States since the, the the existence of the United States, right? I mean, you had enslaved Africans who brought Islam with them to the U.S., um, mm -hmm. but really after 1965, there's a real shift. In the American Muslim community, because of the Hart Seller Immigration Act, because immigration is is opened up really to the globe, um, and you have Muslims coming from all over the world, uh, right? There, there was there was a real contingent of African American Muslims prior to that, but then you see this this great diversification of Islam in the United States, um, and I would say um, th there were there's de there was definitely um, elements of of awkward integration going on in there. And there, there definitely were moments where um, some Salafis particularly, but, but other, other Muslims felt like, no, this, this, we, we the, 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 this is uh, not the daughter of Dar al-Islam, right? This is not the abode of Islam and we need to either convert it or migrate away from it. Right. And they, 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 they thought in those kind of binary terms, we need to either make America Islamic yeah. or we need, we need to, to, to migrate away from it. We, we need to, we're from Hijra. We need to go back to Muslim majority spaces where we can exist. Um, what's what's fascinating, what what I, I really try to get into in the book is in that post 9-11 moment, and Al-Maghrib is founded in the spring of 2002, just a few months after 9-11. Um, hmm. And um, in that post 9-11 moment, when I think a lot of the, the literature on terrorism would say, oh, with all of this increased scrutiny, with all of the, the, this Islamophobia, it's going to radicalize American Muslims. In fact, because you had leaders like the Al-Maghrib sheikhs who were stepping in and saying, no, 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 hold on. There, there are ways that we can think differently. Sheikh, sheikh means, sheikh means. Oh, sorry. So sheikh is, 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 is it's like a teacher, a professor, a mentor, right? It, it, it kind of carries all those connotations. So the, the, the thought leaders, uh, especially the more educated thought leaders in, in the Salafi tradition are often referred to as sheikhs. Um, and um, so the, the, the Al-Maghrib leaders really did help to, I think, um, reinterpret the times that they were living in, right? Because in, in, in any community, especially a scriptural interpretive community, it's not just the hermeneutics of the text, it's the hermeneutics of the times, right? How do you interpret your own circumstances? How do you interpret the circumstances of your community and that's really going to shape your hermeneutics of the text and what 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 analogies you look for in there. Um, and I would say today, if there are um, elements in the American Muslim community or the American Salafi community, I can speak to very particularly, who have some sort of ambition to convert uh, America or to, to 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 take over in some sense, those voices have become incredibly marginalized and, and small. Um, and there there is not um a, a, an active militant community of muslims in the united states as far as i can tell and we don't <laughs> this is why you don't hear about it in the news because it's just it's just not happening really my concern about american evangelicals is much greater on this front actually mm. um american evangelicals um especially since um um you could start it with a trump era but i think i would start it even a little earlier with the obergefell uh, Supreme Court decision that legalized same-sex marriage in the summer of, of 2015. There's been a very um, uh. dangerous shift in the mood and in the hermeneutics of the, of the times in, among American evangelicals, where you are seeing these narratives take hold that evangelicals are embattled, that evangelicals are disempowered. 
And that fuels the rise of what we talk about as Christian nationalism, of Christian supremacy. Um, and and I, I find that that's the kind of very dangerous <laughs> counterexample in many ways um, of a community that really does have power, a community that really does have, have uh, significant demographic power imagining itself to be disempowered and the narratives mm -hmm. of uh, persecution and the, the narratives of reaction to that um, that um, really legitimize attempts by Christians to re-Christianize America, to, to, to recapture. And, to, and, and, and if, if, uh, if the story I'm telling in the book is about how Salafi Muslims counterintuitively embraced pluralism, I think we see American evangelicals today eschewing pluralism. In many in many respects, not all American evangelicals, obviously, right? The 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 herd goes in a lot mm -hmm. of different, different directions. The, the the flock can mm -hmm. kind of move in all kinds of different directions simultaneously. But but there is a real trend among American evangelicals that should be deeply concerning to us who care about pluralism. Yeah, that's fine. Um, on uh, page thirty one, you, you mention about people like uh, Martin Luther and Calvin who. Um, in the early 16th century, we're trying to, you know, really bring people back to the to the true ways of Christianity, so to speak, and the Bible. And um, and uh, do you think that they were parallel uh, leaders or people uh, from a perspective of theopraxy in from a Salafi movement or a Salafi? Mm whatever community <laughs> we don't call it a movement um that would be, be parallel to that who would they be oh that's a that's a great question um yeah so the, the when, when you talk about the, the the salafis as the protestant reformers of islam um and that's not always a positive analogy by the way right like i mean um I, i'm a protestant um i i happen to to like a lot of what luther and calvin had to say but their their track record especially when you talk about orthopraxy and how they treat people was not great. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. um, and, and of course the Protestant Reformation um, unleashed a hundred years of religio political warfare across Europe mm -hmm. that um, led to, to great devastation, right? As, as you had this interpretive pluralism surface and it became politicized, became attached to nation states, who it, it got real messy for quite a while there. Um, I, I, so I, I in, in, um, one of, the, one of the chapters in the book, I I, I describe um, Sheikh Nasser al-Din al-Albani. Um, and I, I think he's he's a fascinating character that I think in some ways is a, a parallel to a Luther or or a oh. Calvin. Um, so for, for those who uh, might not have encountered him, um, al-Albani uh, was raised in Syria, but as is, 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 is his uh, kind of title, Albani sig signals, he's, he's Albanian originally. Um, and... He was um, a, a, an autodidact. He taught himself the Hadith. Um, he, he, didn't, he didn't really have mentors. He just went to the library and, and immersed himself in Hadith for years and years and years. And then became one of the most respected Hadith scholars of his generation. But he had a very deep anti-traditional bent. Um, he had a very deep suspicion of the, the, the madhabs, the, the, the schools of jurisprudence um, in Sunni Islam. And, and he... And he decided that he was going to, I mean, the, 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 there's a little bit of hubris in this. He was going to recanonize the Hadith collections and go back and reevaluate the different Hadiths to see whether they they were were reliable or not, right? And, and mm -hmm. something that that um, had really been settled for centuries in the Islamic tradition, he was willing to um, come at it again and afresh. And he goes and teaches at the Islamic University of Medina, which has been, and I, I, I get into it quite a bit in the book, has been uh, one of the real educational institutions of global Salafism, has been the Islamic University of Medina that was founded by the Saudis to propagate their version of Salafism. But then Albani comes in there and he's not towing the party line. He He's making waves. He's creating all these um, uh, yeah. uh, challenges. And the, and the students are drawn to him even as he, like, and I think that's that's the way that he's in some ways similar to Luther, right? Luther was an institutional player who was within the Catholic Church, and then as he became disillusioned with the Catholic Church, brought his students with him, right? Yeah. And 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 became such a such a compelling force that it it, it created a real threat 
to the establishment. And, and, and Albani, I think, it has, has some of those elements in him, um, is still one of the most important Salafi thinkers just in terms of trend setting, um, even though he passed away around the turn of the century. Um, I also, and, and I, I, I've interviewed him multiple times and, and, and um, have and, and write about him quite a bit in the book. I think Yasser Qadi has been um, a real thought leader um, in, in, in pioneering new forms and new styles of Salafism. And Yasser Qadi was trained at the Islamic University of Medina. Um, when he came back um, in the early 2000s, he was a spitfire, very um, angry preacher. Um, and then he went and did his uh, PhD at Yale um, and, um, and, and really started kind of thinking in different ways about his own background, his own views, his own traditions. And he's still a very conservative figure. He's not, he's not <laughs> some kind of liberal kind of theologian. But Yasser Qadi is, is he, he's a fascinating character in as much as um, he has reinterpreted America for many American Muslims and reinterpreted what it means to um, find an find anchors in American culture. Um, even though he he in his own ways feels kind of alienated from American culture at many points, he's found ways to kind of anchor a form of Islam in in the American community um, that I think has has led tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Muslims to, to think differently about how they interact with American culture. Yeah, that, that integration slash synchronization line is, is, is a constant mm -hmm. um, negotiation with uh, Muslims in America and people of color and other people of marginalized communities. How do you, how do you, how do we fit into that? And we're constantly negotiating that, right? Uh, so it's good to have people who can guide us on that. Um, on the point of uh, Sheikh Albani, I was wondering, um, now I'm wondering if I should call him Sheikh Albani, like how do I even <laughs> defer, defer to him? <laughs> Anyways, uh, Sheikh Albani, we'll keep that for now. Um, you know, he's not focusing on the madahib, right? Or the um, the major jurisprudential schools of Islamic thought or jurisprudence. Um, and you also mentioned that McGrath had quoted him saying that the dead hand of previous generations, right? And we're kind of operating with those. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering now in my own academic studies, when we have female uh, Muslim uh, scho uh, academic scholars uh, in Islam, you know, who are now going back and reinterpreting uh, the tafsir of the Quran, right? Mm -hmm. Not changing the Quran, not most of them, but some of, some of them, but most not changing the Quran. Uh, but reinterpreting it from a female lens, because that was generally speaking missing in the uh, in the literature. There were female scholars, but it just wasn't generally speaking written down what their opinions were on this verse or that verse in the Quran. So, do you think that my question? Sorry, long. Uh, my question is: Do you think that the way that Albani was uh, thinking and writing is similar to what these women are doing today? And some of the Gen Z is doing in terms of being weary of the establishment, um, the Gen Z uh, culture now. So you think in some ways he was kind of an inspiration for women and Gen Zs in general today? I mean, I, I do. I, I think, um, mm -hmm. I mean, Al Albani get, gets in quite a bit of trouble in Saudi Arabia because he, he issues a fatwa, right? And fatwa here just just is the, the learned opinion of an expert, right? It's, it's uh, I, I sometimes compare fatwas to amicus briefs right like it's it's like it's like an advisory opinion that is 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 shared by a scholar upon request but he issues a fatwa in Saudi Arabia that says that that women do not need to cover their faces and he's basing this on hadith and his interpretation of of the precedent of the prophet Muhammad right yeah, this yeah, is it's... what gets him in so much trouble in in Saudi Arabia yeah. he, he he only teaches at the Islamic University of Medina for about 2 years before he gets kicked out two of years. Saudi Arabia yeah. Right. And, 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 and then it's the students who really carry on some of these things, but um, no, it's, it, it is an interesting question. And I, I, I spend um, a, a chapter um, really thinking about women's voices um, in, mm -hmm. in the Islamic tradition and the way that, and we see this in evangelicalism as well. Um, right. If, if the, um, if authority, right. Abstractly, if religious authority and scholarly authority, interpretive authority, is not rooted in tradition, is not rooted in the accolades and approval 
of the establishment and established traditional authorities, right? Then it opens up new possibilities outside of, of the patriarchy, outside mm -hmm. of the hierarchy for other mm -hmm. voices to become accredited, for other voices to step forward. And you can see this, I mean, there, 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 there's a longstanding trend of evangelical women finding their voice through the text mm. and anchoring their interpretation and saying, okay, well, if authority rests in the text, I'm using the text now. So why don't I have authority? Right. And I think I see, you can see some of these similar trends going on, not just in the United States. I mean, there, there, there are, there are um, women who are stepping forward and, and accessing parts of the Islamic tradition that I think um, the, the, the cultures of patriarchy have hidden. I'm not saying I'm not saying Islam hid those right cultures of patriarchy. No, I'm with you 100. Yeah. percent Have hidden those, yeah. and they're uh, just to give an example. And it's not it's not a Salafi institution per se, but there's there's a wonderful um, institution called Rabata in the Twin Cities um, that is um, it's it's women scholars and women teachers teaching their fellow women um, about um, Islam and about and 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 and, and using the authority that that is attached to them, and and you even have. Um, women and I, I, I've interacted with a lot of the the, the students and the, and the teachers there, and um, it's a phenomenal institution. And I think in some ways, what Albani and and even the integration of Salafism into American Islam has opened up is more of these possibilities for for again people who identify and understand themselves as Orthodox to think and and and, and interact in new ways. Right? It's one thing for a, a, a liberal, progressive, um, kind of theologically liberal person to say, oh, I'm discarding all, all of the patriarchy. I'm discarding everything I don't like about the interpretive uh -huh. tradition. Uh -huh. And I'm just going to run in my own direction. And I have my interpretation, right? That, and <laughs> I, I, that's fine. I don't, I don't mind people doing that. But it's a very different thing when you have people saying, no, I am firmly planted in the tradition, but I'm reading it in a different way. Right. And I and I I see something in here that I want you to pay attention to. Like that it's a it's a different form of authority, it's a different identity claim. Um, and and I, I think in the in the ways that people stereotype Salafism as being disempowering to women, I actually think that there's there's space within Salafism. You see this in Al Maghrib, um, for women's voices to become accredited in a new way. Yeah, no, that's that's a beautiful answer. Um and I, and I think part of that uh the impetus behind that could be, you know, if you are going to go back to the first generations, you see how they empowered women and how we yeah. did not. So we're part of that cleaning up the the jahiliya or the ignorance that has been accumulating and and and, and washing Islam of the impurities that's been accumulating over the past years is to go back to that and um, some of the medieval period as well. I think to add mm -hmm. to that. Um, so what one thing that I, I really resonated with was, uh, you know, I used to go to Al Maghrib as well um, or, uh, when I was younger, um, and I, I, I there was something you mentioned uh, where you went to dinner with uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi, uh, Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi, and uh, some of the Al Maghrib students, and the they had arranged the the tables and the chairs in a way that it was advantageous for the entire community to hear everything that Sheikh Yasser had to say. And they you said they, they were they were holding they were like, I mean we <laughs> they were every ounce that they could get of the knowledge every moment they could get was just you know captured and 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 they just couldn't couldn't they didn't want didn't want to leave and they were just um, savoring the moment so to speak right and I resonate with that too because I was I was one of those those students too that was just like man because we didn't have access to knowledge like that um in clear kind of english that things things that you and i are speaking right now in a way that was um culturally culturally resonated with us and so forth right um and shay gasser had a similar background of growing up as, as we did as well so um as someone who's not muslim as someone who was observing this right and as someone who came from maybe a mere tradition in the christian lens how did that make you feel Right. Mm. How, what 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 started to like pump out of your soul your heart mind when you were seeing this like passion for islamic knowledge and right yeah. no yeah i so um 
the, the, just just for for the audience, um, the model of Al-Maghrib, um, and this this again just just kind of drew my attention very early on, was so what, what they would do is they instead of having kind of for a formal building that they are asking students to come and be educated in, they would go they, they'll do weekend seminars, and these are intensive seminars. I mean, it is uh, from Friday night to Sunday night is probably twenty hours of instruction, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it in, in, in packed into a weekend. Um, and 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 students and they'll do the, these at uh, on university campuses and in in, in mm-hmm. spaces that that um, are are very much educationally oriented. Um, and so the I, I went to a, 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 a Al Maghrib seminar at the um, University of Maryland, and um, in in College Park, and we we and I, I had asked Yasser if I could if I could interview him afterwards. And so uh, he's like, oh, sure, a few of us are going to uh, this this uh, halal restaurant afterwards and come, feel free and I'll, I'll try to find a few minutes to talk with you. And it, was, it really was fascinating to see these students who, I mean, they, this, this was on Sunday night. So they they had already spent 20 hours sitting under Sheikh Yasser, right? And listening, yeah. to his, and listening at his feet yeah. and learning from him. Um, and yet uh, about four, I think 30 or 40 students were were there at the restaurant with us. And my wife and I were kind of sitting at a separate table because there, there wasn't even room for us around Sheikh Yasser. And, 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 and people were wanting to soak up even more. And it, it reminded yeah. me of, 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 of when I was a college student going to um, uh, Christian conferences um, and going to Bible study conferences. And mm. like, yeah, there are social reasons that you're there. Yeah, there, there, there are there are social pressures and those uh, those, but part of it is you want the knowledge, right? You you want you want that that close connection to scripture, and you want teachers who can make it plain to you, right? And 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 so I mean, and and the incredible thing is Yasser. I mean, he he had been teaching for twenty hours that weekend, and he still had that energy. He still had that glow, right? Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so. I, I, I think it was a, another one of those moments of deja vu for me where I, it's not a perfect parallel, right? Like checks are not the same as pastors or, or kind of yeah. teachers. Right. But th- it was, it was a moment of, I see a, a, an impulse among these Muslim students that I recognize because I, I, I felt that too. I felt that kind of desperation and I, I, that, that, that moment of the thing that I've been longing for, I am now in the presence of, that knowledge of scripture that I that I can have access to. But the, the other thing that caught my attention that I love about Salafism is, and, and that it feels very Protestant to me, is um, even though all these people are there to learn at Yasser Qadi's feet, even though they're there to, 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 to access the knowledge that he possesses, they are very willing to question him and challenge him. And if they thought he was interpreting something wrong, they'd say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Well, what about the, right?" So it was, it was not it was not that he is the the, the sage on the stage who is simply <laughs> conveying knowledge. Sage on the stage, right? Yeah. He seems like he he he's another human being to them. He's a human being who possesses more knowledge, but they themselves identify as students of knowledge, right? And so there, there's this way that yeah. um, when, when when you disrupt authority. You move it into the realm of access, and there's a democratizing impulse to that that I think is 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 a really wonderful feature of evangelicalism and Salafism. This democratization of knowledge, yeah, um, and 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 in the way that that it invites everyone to be a student, invites everyone to come and access that knowledge. Um, and I saw that that night at the halal restaurant, um, and in talking to Yasser, um, that there was something um, profoundly compelling about it yeah there's um i think it's like try, trying to find a healthy balance of um reverence and deference mm. um at the same time critical critical thinking about it and that's part of the culture right and so okay so you said this but then this hadith says this is ayah says this can you uh, Shay, please enlighten me on this right uh trying, trying to think of find a nicer way to say I don't get where you're getting this from because it's obviously <laughs> contradicting this. You know? <laughs> so um, I, from a racial perspective, I, I wanted to ask you as well about, did you find any striking differences between the Black African descent Salafi, mm. uh, Salafi Muslims and the uh, say Muslims whose families came from other countries? Which yeah, other countries? No, it's a great question. Um, and for those, again, who, who might not know the American Muslim history that much, so uh, black Muslims um, largely congregated around Nation of Islam, 
in the in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and then, of course, um, Elijah Muhammad passed away, um, and his son, Warth Deed Muhammad, kind of stepped forward in, in leadership in the community, and Louis Farrakhan led a breakaway movement that claimed the Nation of Islam title, but it, it, it really there really is a disjunction that occurred. And in that moment of disjunction, where you had these two kind of competing trajectories of the Nation mm -hmm. of Islam, the, the Louis Farrakhan trajectory and the Warth Deed Muhammad trajectory that really wanted to be more mainstream Sunni, a lot of African American Muslims felt very disillusioned because um, they, they 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 thought that they'd had that, and then suddenly there's this fracture, and so many of them became Salafis. And so there still are um, large Salafi communities that are African American, um, and especially in in Philadelphia, in some in in Camden, New Jersey, there there there's still large pockets of African American Salafis. Um, what I found, um, and 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 it was it was <laughs> because it, it was a question I had perpetually is those African American Salafi communities, not not across the board. I mean, there are many African American Salafis who participate in Al Maghrib, but the, the, those Salafi communities have tended to be, if anything, more much more hardline in their mm -hmm. Salafism, yeah, yeah, than than the Al Maghrib types, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to kind of get to the the root of that, and and what I actually found was <laughs> a lot of that actually has to do with Saudi government policy. Of all things, mm. because the Saudi government tried to, in, in many ways, hijack the Islamic University of Medina in the 1990s and install their loyalists, especially this one professor, this one Sheikh Rabi al madkali And as as many of these African American leaders were going to study there, they studied with al madkali and then they came back and 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 brought some of his hardline things, including hardline things around like you can find this sentiment among African American Salafis, like no, we need to be loyal to the Saudi royal family. Right, which feels absurd if, if if you're only thinking in terms of America. But again, this is a kind of transnational dimension of things, and and the Almagro folks are are the folks who kind of uh, resist that in many ways, and and have have in many ways denounced the the identity the ideas of Al Yeah, and 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 this is an interesting thing to think about just globally, because the same the same Sheikh uh, Rabi Al Markali was very influential of a full generation of Salafis globally because they were people from all over the world studying in in Saudi um, dur, under al madhali and at the Islamic University of Medina and um and so there's you can you can still find this if you go look at the literature on salafism in Europe the literature on salafism in the Mediterranean Rabi al madhali still has a very uh, profound influence on many salafi communities mm -hmm. um, and um and, and and has ignited very similar debates in many spaces. I think it has played out in such a fascinating way in the United States, though, where you you have in many ways a rejection of because a lot of was very anti-democracy. He didn't think that Muslims should participate in democracy because he saw it as un-Islamic, mm -hmm. right? Where the Almagreb sheikhs, especially somebody like Walid Basuni, who's the the, the president of Almagreb, um, has, has he, he endorsed Barack Obama, he endorsed Hillary Clinton. In 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 uh, 2012 and 2016, and so you have um, you have more openness, I'd say, in the Amalgam crowd than in a lot of these African American Salafi crowds. Again, not not for any kind of purely racial reasons or anything. It, it really does go back to some of who were who were the professors these folks studied under, and and how did that kind of shape their outlook uh, on on the tradition? Yeah, and I, I think even. Um... When I, I talked to some of the even uh, black Christian preachers, right, and they would mention that, you know, it, in the black community, if they knew a, w a woman like in high school was Muslim, those guys knew she was off limits mm -hmm. because she is a very like pious and and modest woman who cannot be engaged with by by us who are trying to get a trying to get a girl, you know. So it was like it was very interesting because the, the reputation they had. They kept that going, uh, even into Sunni Islam uh, mm. from the nation of uh, being very, very strict to the principles. You mentioned uh, this uh, uh, program called uh, Awana uh, mm. when you were younger, and uh, <laughs> and how they would, um, if you memorize a smaller Bible biblical verse, you would get candy, and if you memorize a larger biblical verse, you get a candy bar, maybe a Snickers or something. I don't know. And um, and and you mentioned uh, you know that hey it, it worked for me because I still if I go to lectures I can finish what they're gonna say before they finish that Bible quote right and um, and then talk more about how those experience and you know and I, I think about in, in the Muslim community the, the parallel is uh, when kids are sent to the madrasa which means school um, and they're doing the hiv program um, 
uh, or when they memorize the Quran, you know, and that kind of resonated with me. And then I, I'm thinking about uh, how, how you mentioned your experience with your children, right? And how they're in school now, how that's different than what you what you went through. And can you talk more, more, more about that experience with your children and, and and how you kind of relate to your childhood and their childhood and and how you choose to where put them in school in that regard? Yeah, the so the, the title of the book, Scripture People, is is my attempt to find a common language because when, when, when evangelicals talk about themselves in contrast to other Christians, they'll often say, oh, we are uh, Bible-believing Christians. As, as though like other Christians didn't believe the Bible, right? But they they, they have an atta <laughs> a personal attachment to the Bible. And similarly, when Salafis um, will refer to themselves, they'll sometimes call themselves people of the Hadith. Mm. Right? That, that we we are we are al, -Hal al Hadith. We we are we are the people who hold the Hadith, right? And um and 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 I and I think that there's a a way if you if you have not participated in those communities, that that seems arrogant. Right, it seems like oh, you, you th these people are claiming that they're the real scripture adherents, right? But there, there is there is an investment. There's a, there's a deep uh, investment in these communities. So I grew up going to this, uh, participating in this organization called Awana. It, it's it's an acronym that uh, comes from a Bible verse that doesn't really have anything to do with what the organization does. It was just <laughs> the, the the title they chose. But Awana specializes in Bible memorization. And so every week I would go and I would I would immerse myself in memorizing the Bible. And then they, as you were saying, they, they would incentivize this with sugar. And so ironically, though, those, those passages are stuck in my head, right? That the social engineering of these parachurch ministries to, to get children to memorize scripture is still is still built into me. It's still a part of me. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 I, I I the the thing that occasioned that in the book was I was I was reading a, a Salafi magazine and there was there was a an advertisement for a children's daycare program in one of these Salafi magazines, and it's it and and in this like it's it's, it's like a it's like a preschool kind of space, but they're also talking about hadith memorization, and Quran memorization and Arabic right and and there's there's a way that the culture of study of scripture wraps everyone up in it, even the youngest, right? And, and, and draws those people in. They, they are being mentored into being scripture people, mentored into being al-Hadith, mentored into being Bible-believing Christians. Um, and um, now that I'm not, I, now that I don't identify as evangelical, um, uh, and my wife and I have, have grappled with, how do, we, how do we raise our children? Because we both come from evangelical backgrounds. How do we raise our children in the faith? And what we realized, what we've realized over time is um, evangelicalism gives a very structured and very clear sense of how, how to be a Christian. Now, I, I, I'm sure many of us would have problems with that, 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 that summary, right, or, or tensions with it, but it, it, it gives a, a very clear outline. And we have chosen, like, I looked, there's like five Awana <laughs> gatherings within a few miles of my home. We haven't chosen to do that with our children, um, but we have tried mm -hmm. to find more structured churches. In fact, we were going to a church today that would probably not be the church that my wife and I would choose on our own uh, with our theology and our orientation. It's more evangelical than I think what we would choose, but it's great for our kids and it gives them a lot of structure. And I think um, it, it's, a, it's a challenge in our pluralistic environment how do you raise children up being exposed to the best of your tradition and still hold that lightly as in allowing them space to make choices and, and figure out who they are in the world? Um, and, and I think there's something really powerful about young people encountering scripture and, 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 and feeling a sense of connection and ownership to it. And I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't want to go quite as far as I did as a, as a child, but I want my children to be exposed to the best of that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I I had a, a colleague and friend of mine um, yeah. who, was, who was who was Asian, and um, you know he wanted his child children to learn uh, martial arts, and um, he's he is uh, from even a Christian background, and at, at some point they started to implement Buddhism into the practice and he took him out at that point he's like my kids are christian we're a christian we're not going to even though kung fu originated from that region you know, so it's culturally it was part of his energy but there was a certain point where religion took precedence yeah. so time for us to wrap up 
Um, so first of all, I wanted to thank everyone who was in, involved today, um, the Oxford Interfaith Forum. Uh, Cesar, thank you so much. Thea, thank you so much, so much for, um, and, and of course, um, our professor, Dr. Matthew, uh, and author. Um, you know, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book. Um, and and uh, I think, you know, in, in summary, we're, we're really looking at uh, people who are, are are mirroring a very similar um, theology and and praxis uh, and kind of walking that path together um, and at some point having to have very um, very intentional and and very 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 potent and, and very true dialogues honest dialogues with the one other and uh, with internally and also externally so um, I, I do recommend reading um, his book and I think once you do read his book then you will uh, also find other uh, topics you kind of engage in and run into. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I went to Baylor uh, myself, uh, which is the largest Baptist university in the world. And uh, I, I, I consider it to be a Baptist Saudi Arabia uh, in, in all of its <laughs> essence. So uh, this book was very edifying for me. I'm sure you all very much enjoy it as well. Thank you.